Okay, we're going to be uh, starting with a sermon this morning uh, now, and we, because I want my sermon to set us up for the, for the communion that is going to be coming. So we're going to have a time of worship, of course, but I want to bring the message first, because today we are sharing in communion once again. And we're not specifically told how often to share in communion, but we are told that each and every time that we share in communion, we do two things. We remember that which the Lord has done for us. And we remember that He is coming again. In the times in which we are living, these end times, there's going to be people who are saying, well, Jesus hasn't come back over all of these years. It's obvious He's not going to come back. No. That is not good logic. A better logic is to say, my Bible has prophesied all of these things. All of these things about the birth of Jesus, the death of Jesus, all of these things about the great kingdoms of the world in the book of Daniel, which we're going through in our daily readings, all of these things the, the book has prophesied have all come about. And there's a few still to come about. Therefore, if all of these prophecies have been fulfilled as prophesied, there is no doubt that the prophecies still left to be fulfilled will also be fulfilled 100%. So we need to remember what Jesus has done and is continuing to do. It's of critical importance to me that our sharing of communion never becomes a ritual, a tradition. Something you just do, well, it's the first day of the month, let's tick it off. No, no, no. I limit the times that we share in communion in order to keep it special, to keep it fresh. Because I want you looking forward to say, wow, this Sunday's communion. Let me get up and let me get ready and let me prepare myself. It's not something that, that we just need to get finished with as part of the program. This whole service is geared towards communion. I am leading us along a path which will culminate in a sharing in communion together. Communion is the very core of the Christian belief. Jesus dying for us. And the fact that he's coming again is the core of what we are standing on. May the Spirit lead us through this service. May the Spirit prepare our hearts to share in communion. That by the time we get to these emblems, we are ready. By the time we get there, we are saying, thank you, Lord Jesus. You are a mighty God. Now, in Ephesians 5, we get the, the Apostle Paul's instructions to husbands and instructions to wives in order to love and care for one another. And this marriage relationship between husband and wife is a representative of our relationship between Christ and the church. And the people of God are the bride. Christ is the bridegroom. This is what Ephesians 5 says. Reading from verse 30 says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Christ and the church, you and your Jesus. You in relationship with Jesus, as you function as a church, as a member of a church, as you function, we are part of the bride of Christ. Your relationships or, rela or marriage relationships on earth are a representation somehow. There's a mystery, the Apostle Paul says. But as husband and wife become one, so we become one in Christ Jesus. As corporately being the bride, the bride of Christ who are making themselves ready for the return of the bridegroom. Now in 1 
first century Jewish culture, when a man has his eye on a woman, there would be a ceremonial tradition to follow. The man would go to the father's house, the father of the girl, and he would sit and speak to the father and to the girl that he's got his eye on. He would present them with a ketubah, a marriage co uh, covenant, as it were. And along with that ketubah, he would negotiate, he would lay out his intentions, he would lay out his future expectation, he would agree a bridal price to recompense the father for raising the girl, and to show his love for her, of course, like our local custom of Labola. And in effect, she has been bought with a price. He's been, she has been bought with a price from her father, and they both have a say in this agreement. It's not a one-sided thing. He comes in, and he lays it out before her. This is my covenant. This is my intention. This is what I want to do. This is my vision for the future. He lays it all out before her. And at the end of this time of communication, he would pour a glass of wine. And he would put the glass of wine on the table before her. And that cup of wine was symbolic of the blood covenant that he was inviting her into. If she took the glass and she drank from the cup, she would be symbolically accepting him as her future husband. She had total say whether she was going to drink or not. She was not coerced, she was not forced in any way. And they would be betrothed to, to one another from that time on. Or as we would call it in our day, engaged to one another. If she refused to drink from the cup, she was declining his offer of marriage. And this betrothal is a legally binding agreement between the two of them, and it was considered as marriage, even being called husband and wife, even though they haven't consummated the marriage. If either one was to die, legally speaking, the, the remaining partner would be a widow or a widower. At Obviously, at time of marriage, there would be consummation of the marriage and they would enter into the blood covenant that he had invited her to come into. If she went out of the house, she would wear a veil over her face, signifying that she has been bought with a price, she is accounted for, and she is betrothed to her husband. The same as what we read with Joseph and Mary in Luke 1. In Luke 1, 27, it says, To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. A legally binding contract. Even though Mary and Joseph had not been married, they had not consummated their marriage, it was still considered a legal contract. Now, getting back to our man who has his eye on his cherry. When she drinks of that cup, she is entering into covenant with her man. And the two are seen as married. They're not married and consummated, but they are betrothed to one another for marriage. He then leaves the girl's father's house and he returns to his own father's house in which there are many rooms, and he proceeds to build on a bridal suite for them, known as a chuppah. And in every Jewish wedding, they get married under a canopy called a chuppah, signifying that, that room that the man would go and build. And of course, in today's tradition, it's a little bit different, but that is what the chuppah at a, at a wedding represents. And from time to time, the father would come and inspect the son's work and make sure that it's up to standard. And when the father deems that the room is complete, he sends his son back to the girl to bring her home to marry her. And the bridegroom comes. When he comes for his bride, he comes with his entourage. And when they are within distance, but still a little way off, they sound the shofar, which is signaling, we have arrived, we are here. 
And the bride has to be constantly ready as she never knows the, the hour or the time that her man is coming back for her. She has an idea of the season, of course, because he's been speaking to her. She knows it is coming, but she never knows quite when it is coming. So she keeps her things ready at the head of her bed. She has her lamp. She has her veil. She has the other essentials that she would need when she has to grab and go. She just takes her essentials. Her bridesmaids too, they need to be ready. They need to have oil in their lamps because they never know when the bridegroom is coming for his bride. You may wonder why we sometimes blow the shofar in the church. Let's take a look at a few scriptures. What does the shofar represent? Well, in Psalm 98.6, it says, With trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn, shout for joy before the Lord, the King. So in that psalm, it is, a, it is an, an excitement of shouting to God. It is, it is glorifying God and exalting Him. In Joel 2.1, it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. So here in Joel, it is blown as a warning. In Zephaniah 1.16, it says, A day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. So it can be a battle cry. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So as the bridegroom comes for his wife, so Jesus is coming for his bride and he's going to sound the shofar and the dead in Christ will rise. In 1 Corinthians 15, 52, it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Throughout the Bible, you'll be surprised at how many times you read about the, word, the, the shofar, the trumpet blowing. It has many, many things that it signifies. Just recently, the Jews celebrated the Rosh Hashanah. In that celebration, the trumpet is blown 100 times for different purposes. It is blown in different ways, signifying different things. But the shofar will be heard right around the world when Jesus returns for his bride. So get used to its sound. What I would like to ask our shofar blowers is that you limit your time of blowing the shofar to when we are praising and exalting the Lord. And when we get into a deeper time of worship, then we refrain from the shofar. Because people are going to be getting quiet before the Lord. And the last thing we want is a, is a sharp sound that's going to give people a fright and, and take them out of the spirit. We do not want that, folks. So there is a place for the shofar, but let us use it in its place. I want us to get deeper and deeper into our times of worship with the Lord. As we get deeper, we need to get more quiet inside. We need to get more quiet around. Standing awe and reverence of our Almighty God. But Jesus has come to you. He seeks an intimate relationship with you. As the bride and the the bridegroom. He lays out his plans and his vision in his word. He sets a cup before you. And each time you drink of that cup, you ratify your decision in that marriage covenant. That is what we are doing today. We are ratifying our decision. We are reminding ourselves we are in covenant with Jesus. It's not a small thing, folks. A blood covenant is the the deepest, the most respected form of covenant. Do not take it lightly when we come and, and share in communion together. In John 14, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. You can see the correlation with what Jesus is saying to the ancient traditions of marriage in first century Jewish culture. 
What a beautiful picture it paints of communion. And of our groom with whom we are in close relationship with. Are you in close relationship with the bridegroom? Is church just something, well, I'm a Christian, so I've got a ticket off for the week? Or do you come into this place with a fire in your heart, wanting to, to worship God together, eager to hear His Word? What is God saying to me today? Ready to glean from His Word so that you can get deeper into this relationship with us. In Matthew 9, Jesus actually describes Himself as, as the groom. Every time we share in communion, it reminds us that we, together, are the bride of Christ. I am not excluding other believers. We are part of the bride of Christ. No one here is above anybody else. Together, we make up the bride as one. We drink the cup as ratification of our acceptance of this marriage union with Jesus. And our groom goes home to his father's house to prepare a place for us. And when that place is ready, Jesus is coming back for you. I can imagine that that place Jesus has gone to prepare is magnificent. It will only be ready when the father tells the son... It's ready. Go fetch your bride. When it is ready, and only when it is ready, the Father says, go fetch your bride. We read it in Matthew 24, 36, that not even the Son knows when He will be sent back. It says, but of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. That young man who had his eye on his cherry, when he was putting his bridal suite together, he had to wait for his father to say, okay, son, go fetch. It wasn't up to him to decide. He had to submit to the father as we submit to our father and Jesus submits to the father. But Jesus has been busy preparing for his bride, not knowing when the father will give the instruction. Continually ministering to us saying, come on, keep up the faith. Come on, you can do better in this area. Come on, I'm not sure when I'm coming, but it is soon. And the word soon there means it is quickly. When Jesus said, I am coming soon, 2,000 years ago, people mock him and say, ah, oh, you see, he didn't know what he was talking about. He knew very well what he was talking about. He did not know the timing. But what he is saying is, when the Father sends me, it will be quick. I will come. But he doesn't know when, and neither do we. But that day is getting closer and closer with every day that passes. That day when the skies will be rolled back and the trumpet shall resound. That day spoken of in scripture so many times, so many years ago is about to unfold. And you and I will receive the, war, the reward that is due to us. What a blessed day day that will be when the trumpet sounds signaling the, signaling the end of this church age and the joyful ascent of the bride for the marriage feast of the Lamb. In Revelation 19 it says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then He said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And He said to me, These are the true sayings of God. How real is this to you. That Jesus is coming back and we will ascend and we will enjoy the supper of the Lamb, the marriage feast of the Lamb. How real is partaking of communion to you? Does it resonate within you? That my Jesus is coming back 
I need to be ready. Is that what you're living for? Or is your Christian walk just another facet of your life? Just one of many things that you do and one of many things that you serve, one of many things that you worship. It's obvious as you look around the world that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled as we live. Every prophecy fulfilled so far has been fulfilled a hundred percent as it was prophesied. Even where you read of the things of Jesus being born and being called out of Egypt. And, oh, and you think, how can it be he's, he's going to be born in Bethlehem? How can he be called out of Egypt? All of prophecies all filled, fulfilled 100%. It gives us great reassurance that the remaining prophecies will be completed no less than how it is written. When you drink of this cup, may the realization of the reality of your relationship with Jesus become so much more clearer in your understanding. The fact that you have been bought with a price you are accounted for. When you're out there, it's as if there should be a veil. I'm not saying walk around with a veil on. I'm not trying to start some new sect or something. But in your heart, you need to know, I am in this world, but I am not of this world. I am accounted for. I have been bought with a price. I am the bride of Christ. It needs to be special to you. Not just something light. Not getting mixed up with the affairs of this world as you are spoken for and you belong to him. And as a bride in our days will spend a year or whatever readying herself for her groom, and that's just for an earthly man. So too, we as the bride need to ready ourselves for his return. Let's consider just a few of the steps. I've never been a bride and some of the guys might think, yo, it's a bit of a long stretch calling me the bride of Christ. Well, the Bible also calls women the sons of God. Is that not true? Let us consider some steps. Possibly, I would imagine, if I was a woman, I would watch what I would eat before I'm getting married to be as trim as possible so I can fit into my beautiful dress. I might want to drink more water so I can cleanse my complexion so I can look more glowing and beautiful like me. <laughs> Maybe I would make sure I would stay away from anyone who may cause me to veer off my path. Maybe I have my nails done all pretty and make them all nice. Maybe I get my hair, well, if I had hair, get my hair done all fancy so I can really look, look the part. Make sure I've got a stunning dress to appear in. All of this preparation is just for an earthly man. How much more should the bride of Christ be readying herself for the Son of God to come back for his bride? So many things she does to get ready. Why? Because this is the biggest day of her life. She's marrying the man of her dreams. How much bigger is the day when Jesus comes back for his bride and we get to spend eternity with him in his presence? What are we, getting, what are we doing to get ready for our groom? Ask yourself that question. What are you doing to ready yourself for the return of Jesus? If you, as a woman or... As a guy, also guys do a, as guys do a little bit to get ready for marriage, but not quite what a woman does. I must confess, it's, life is much easier as a man, and it makes us appreciate you ladies all the more. We realize life is a bit more tough as a woman. But look how beautiful a woman can, can be as a bride. There's no, it's hard to find a greater picture than a bride work, walking in on her wedding day. That is a beautiful picture. But what are we doing? What are we doing to get ready? When that trumpet resounds and the skies are rolled back, what are we doing? Are we casual in it? Because we need to be preparing ourselves, folks. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. In my heart, I feel it is soon. 
As I read the word, I, I see there's still a few things that need to happen. But we need to live like the apostle Paul lived. That every day it could be today. Let us not let our doctrine of what we still think needs to happen get in the way of us expecting the return of Jesus. The imminency of Christ who could come back for his church any day. It just takes the word of the Father. To what extent are we prepared to go to ensure that we are ready and functioning at our best, doing what he asks us to do, having oil in our lamps? What are we doing, folks? And as we take this cup this morning, let us relook, each one of us, let us relook where we are at. Don't worry about the other people. Don't think, oh, this church needs to do a whole lot before Jesus comes back. I know we do. But unless we take that first step, we will achieve nothing. The journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. What is your first step? Let us look at what we personally, me, I am doing to prepare for his return. Let us make sure that we are as eager as a bride for her wedding day. Let us make sure we are eager for the return of our Jesus. Preparing for that day. For the wedding feast of the Lamb is before us. Get ready. Get excited. Get prepared. Heavenly Father, I've delivered your message, Lord. You are calling us to preparedness. And as a bride prepares for her groom, so too, Lord, we want to be ready for your return. We want to be doing that which you call us to do. Holy Spirit, would you move in each one of us personally? Would you help us to set things straight? There may be something different in every one of our lives, but you, Holy Spirit, you know what is needed, for you live on the inside. You have intimate knowledge of what goes on in our heart and in our thoughts. Would you help us, Lord, to refine ourselves in your fire, all through the power of the Holy Spirit, that when that trumpet sounds, we will have no regrets, we will not be raptured upside down trying to hang on to our goods. We will have our arms up saying, yes, Lord Jesus, hallelujah, I'm ready to meet you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to get into a time of worship now. I want you to still your heart. I want you to think of what I've been speaking about. What is the Lord saying to you today? and tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, until you die. Until you breathe your last, you need to be... No, what is the Lord saying to me? The Lord's going to speak to some of you in this worship time this morning. May you hear His voice. May you respond to Him. Because your God loves you. He's gone to prepare a place for you. Why? Because He loves you. You are His. He's paid for you with his life blood. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Come stand, let's sing together. Yes, Lord, more and more we want every aspect of our life to honor you, Lord. We thank you for your forgiveness for times past where we have not honored you. And we thank you, Lord, for the infilling of your Holy Spirit to help us to honor you more in more and more aspects of our life. For you are our King. You are the one who is seated on the throne of our hearts. You are the one who is calling the shots in our lives. We are in submission to you, Lord. You are our King. You are our Lord. You are our Master. You have bought us with a price. We belong to you. We are no longer our own. We are yours. We are accounted for. And we are just waiting for the groom to come fetch us. Help us, Lord, that in this time of waiting, that we will be found doing what you give us to do. That we will not be drawn into the things of this world 
But we will remain your sons and your daughters, Lord, eager for your return. Joyfully declaring your glory. Sharing this joy with others so that they too may come in and enjoy that which we enjoy. Help us, Lord. Go with us now as we leave this place. May your protection be with us, Lord. May your spirit be powerfully stirring within us. May we know your provision. May we know your protection. May we know your healing. May we know your presence. May we know the joy of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Be blessed.